All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the Crawford School and to the Australian National University. Uh, my name is Stephen Howes, and I'm the director of the Development Policy Centre, and uh, we're hosting today's event. Uh, so welcome from us, as well as from AusAid, uh, who have um, played a key part in putting this event uh, together and making it possible, and the Australian Disability and Development uh, Consortium. Uh, let me begin by acknowledging the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and by paying our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Uh, it, it's a really uh, uh, an interesting topic and uh, good format that we've got today. So I'm looking forward to a uh, you know, really um, stimulating uh, one and a half hours. We've called this the Disability Inclusive Development Forum. So I wanted to call it Disability Inclusive Development Q&A but I think Tony Jones has uh, copyrighted that. <laughs> so we're calling it a forum. But the idea is it's meant to be very interactive and participatory. So we won't, uh, it won't be a traditional sort of academic format. Um, I'll be asking some questions and uh, we'll be inviting questions uh, from the floor. And I'll also be encouraging our panelists to you know, make comments, react to what their other panelists are saying, uh, ask their own questions. So it should be uh, quite uh, freewheeling, fast moving, and uh, I'm sure we'll all, all learn something uh, a lot. I think the other reason it's a really, uh, you know, should be illuminating is because this is still a new topic. I know some of you here, including on this panel, are real experts uh, in this area, but uh, probably most of the people in the room aren't. Uh, certainly for myself, I'd, I'd put myself in that category and uh, I could see people around the room who've got an interest in development but perhaps haven't spent a lot of time thinking about the issues around disability in that, in that context. Anyway, that's enough from me. Let me uh, just introduce the three panellists and then we'll start, uh, ask them all to make sort of opening remarks and then we'll follow that up and see how, how we go. Uh, so just starting at this end, uh, let me... Uh, introduce first Senator Montian Buntan, who is a senator from Thailand, and uh, he has uh, actually has an academic background. So welcome back to uh, the university, as well as uh, extensive uh, studies in Thailand and then in the USA. He also was a university lecturer for eight years, but uh, he then left his teaching career behind, became full-time social activist in 2002. He's currently in his second four-year term as president of Thailand's Association of the Blind. Uh, he's been a senator since 2008, and he's also active internationally, including on the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, his favorite slogan is, I've given up on giving up. <laughs> then uh, next to him and next to me is uh, Setareki Makanawai who is the Chief Executive, Office, sorry, Chief Executive Officer of the Pacific Disability Forum. And he also is uh, very active both uh, in Fiji, where he's based, and uh, internationally. He's currently the Chief Executive Officer of the Pacific Disability Forum, which is an umbrella organization for over 20 Pacific-based disabled people's organizations. And he's, uh, I should say, our centre takes particular interest in Pacific and PNG issues, so we're delighted to have you here. Uh, Seth has also been very involved in the uh, development of AusAid's disability strategy. And I should add, all three members of the panel are part of the AusAid uh, reference group, as I think it's called, for the uh, Disability Inclusive Development Strategy. And they're meeting here today in Canberra. So once again, our thanks to AusAid for um, suggesting this event and making it, making it possible. Um, but going back to Seta, he's, uh, in, in recognition of his work, he's been presented with a number of awards, including the Pacific Regional Rights Resource Team 2008 Pacific Human Rights Special Citations Award. So it's an honour to have you here uh, with us. And then uh, finally, on my right, I have uh, Charlotte McLean Nlapo, and she's the coordinator for the Office, uh, Office for Disability and Inclusive Development in the USAID. So it'll be very interesting to get a perspective from another very important donor um, on this uh, whole issue. Um, prior to uh, her appointment uh, in uh, USAID, she was uh, with the World Bank, 
where she worked in the East Asia and uh, Pacific region. So uh, haven't quite worked out whether we've overlapped, but uh, it's nice to have a former colleague uh, alongside me. I also served my time in the World Bank. Uh, she's a human rights lawyer with a particular interest in marginalized groups, and she has extensive uh, involvement uh, in South Africa. In 1999, she was appointed by President Mandela to, to the South African Human Rights Commission and she was then reappointed by President Becker in 2002. She's also active internationally, uh, in particular uh, with the United Nations. So we have a uh, extraordinarily distinguished, uh, diverse group here, uh, and, and a very international group. Uh, it's our great fortune uh, to have you all. Thank you for giving up your time uh, to be with us today. And uh, let's uh, get underway. So I'm gonna just go along the uh, table, and I'll start with you, Senator. Uh, you know, if you could just get the ball rolling by starting about, I guess, your own involvement, uh, how you came to be involved in advocacy on the, for the rights of people with disabilities, and, um, you know, what sort of success you've had, uh, what's your, been your experience in government in influencing policy? Thank you very much, Steve, and, and um, very good afternoon to all of you here. It's uh, an honor to share my experience and thoughts. Well, everything started with, you know, your own life. You know, I, I grew up in a farm and you know, being blind since birth and had to go through all, all kinds of difficulties and uh, especially when it comes to discrimination and inequality. But I didn't really, you know, get stuck with, with what I really encounter, I, I, I observe uh, the ongoing struggle uh, and movement of people of different uh, categories, you know, starting from the democracy movement in Thailand in 1970s. When I was very young, I got in, very into political, uh, uh, I have a lot of interest in, in politics. Uh, including domestic and international politics, by the way. So when I grew up and I went to study in the United States, I got involved in uh, several movements as, as well, in you know, the disability movement and uh, human rights issues. So with, with all of that and, and feeling that uh, my opportunity, either through my own personal struggle or through luck, or whatever you want to say, I don't want to be an exceptional person. I see uh, that it, it, there's got to be something wrong, you know, that uh, a few people can have some opportunity to, to succeed to, or fail, while some people could, could just fail all, the, the, uh, all their lives. So and upon my return from the United States, I got heavily involved in the in the blindness and disability movement in Thailand, uh, starting from being an advisor first while teaching at the university. And then I became full-time yeah, uh, activist uh, working from, you know, from then. Uh, I, I got involved in the youth movement of the World Blind Union. I became first vice president of uh, National uh, Association of the Blind, Thailand Association of the Blind. And uh, through that, I, I see the need to work with other sectors within the civil society, not only in the disability movement, but in, in other uh, issues as well, because we cannot stand alone, work from, from our problems, but we need to be recognized. So when the position is, well, when, when the Constitution open up for for me to be nominated and elected uh, as member of the Senate. I actually, I didn't choose to do so, but I was given mandate by uh, unanimous, uh, I would say, votes or agreement from disability communities in Thailand to, to be in, in the Senate House. And that also, <coughs> coincidentally work at the same time as I, my role in the uh, drafting and negotiation of, of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, where I got to meet uh, Charlotte and, and a lot of people. Um, 
So in that sense, I, I think we need to really look into how we can situate ourselves in our own personal struggle and share such common feeling with our people who are sharing the same situation with us, make ourselves assertive enough and also make alliance with with other groups of people and I believe in political process. You know, when when I say about political process I mean politics within this disability movement, politics among civil society, and poli politics in the mainstream political establishment. Uh, the, what, it, what I have been able to do is mainly through legislation, formulation of national legislation, uh, and also my influence and my acti active role in the international uh, human rights law such as CRPD, and also regional policy framework on disability issues. So uh, being in, in the Senate uh, doesn't mean that you can do everything, mm -hmm. but you need to, a a again, get people's, uh, at least they have to recognize our role, and they also have to recognize uh, our contribution uh, beyond our own issue. So that's what I've been doing for the, five, for the past five years. I've been working in the in the area of, uh, of uh, people without legal status, you know, dis displaced people, and, and I've been dealing with he the mainstream human rights issues. Uh, also recently got involved more into the disastrous reduction. Um, all, all of these things could, could accumulate my role and recognition of uh, being a person with disability, but with this position. To advocate for ourselves, to advocate for our co friends and colleagues, but also to contribute, to contribute to the whole society. That's, that's what we mean uh, by, by being actively involved in the political process. Yeah. Okay, uh, terrific. I that's uh, a very rich uh, set of remarks which uh, we could discuss for a long time. We'll come back to a lot of those points. I think I'll turn now to, to you, Seta, and just ask you a uh, sort of similar set of questions to reflect on your own experience in a very different context. You know, I can't imagine really two more different regions uh, than uh, the Pacific and Asia. And uh, what progress you've seen, uh, you know, during your time in terms of the uh, rights of the disabled. I'll just, uh, we have to share the microphone. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. I'll shift this across. Yeah, it's, it just, it's just on the wall. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> yes, uh, thank you uh, um, to ANU. Uh, thank you, Stephen, for the, the opportunity uh, to OSE and also to ADDC uh, and to you, uh, the audience that are here. It wouldn't be a forum without you sitting here, otherwise, uh, <laughs> three of us would be talking to, uh, to, to walls in this room. Uh, unlike uh, Santa Muntian, who's a good friend of mine over many years, um, I, I, I was not born blind. I was a sighted uh, person until I was doing my last year at high school in an in a, in a, in a, in old boys' school in, uh, in, in, in Suba, in Fiji, um, in, a, in a boarding school. The, uh, what, what struck me when I lost my sight it kind of changed my life too. In many ways, um, uh, the, 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 the uh, aspirations I had, the opportunities that were there as a sighted person, kind of diminished uh, or, or almost gone uh, when I became blind. So uh, in terms of, in terms of um, then, then the, with, with aspirations to continue with life, and the people that I met across uh, in, in those early years. And I think what is very important is the support system that's around you when something tragic like that happens, if, you, if I can call it that. Um, the, the, uh, to be able to put the pieces together and, 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 and uh, carry on with life. The, um, the, uh, and then in, in trying to, uh, to, to, to focus and trying to get on with life as a blind person, 
and, and the challenges that, that uh, I faced really made me very angry. I was angry about trying to get used to being a blind person. I was angry with systems that are not there to support a blind person realize his dream and his aspiration. So with that, uh, I guess, anger and, and the desire to, to make a difference. Um, uh, Santa Monjan's uh, slogan is, uh, he's given up on giving up. Mine is on seizing every opportunity to make a difference. So I took it upon myself and even trying to go to teacher's college. I wasn't wanting to, didn't want to be a teacher in the first place when I was growing up. But that opportunity came uh, to go to a teacher's college. As a blind person, I was not be able, I could not get a government scholarship. They don't do that, that time to blind people. You're not supposed to be at this college. Mm -hmm. Then the, so we had to almost kind of go through the back door or the window to get a scholarship. So I, 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 I was aware of all these conversations, these arrangements. And I, I uh, and growing up in, 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 in Fiji, in, 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 in Suba, where there's a lot of barriers and challenges facing person disabilities and I guess, like Senator, teaming up with other people with disabilities in a disability movement in Fiji uh, and trying to address our issues and to raise awareness. The, uh, so I, I, I guess the challenge that I took upon myself is I need to do something so that others who are coming after me do not go through the same hell, excuse the language. That is what I took upon myself as a personal goal which I still kind of carry with me today. And, 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 and uh, doing that with the, in, in, in Fiji, I managed to go through, I turned up for the first time at teacher's college, the teachers didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> I guess probably not new to some, some in this room. Because yeah. I had similar experience when I went to study at the University of Chattanooga in, in, in Tennessee. I also had a similar experience at the university I attended here in Australia, and I came to do, to do my master's. Yeah. The, so then the, 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 it's almost like having to fight a battle all the time. You want to do something about yourself to make things better. And that's the, um, the I guess, the, the, the fighting spirit that you develop in trying to change things. So then, then working at, the, at the, the School for the Blind, we managed to change things around. I, I uh, managed to get a posting. Because I'm a blind person, I was literally supposed to be teacher of a teaching blind school, though I, there was no special education course I, I did. And all my teaching practice was in regular schools, teaching sighted children. But then, I guess the thinking around, I guess you have to, have to live with, with the myth, have to live with perceptions about disability, um, enrolled uh, in, in the public service as, as, as a civil servant, as a teacher, you are, um, and I guess, and, and, and being young at those time, and then wanting to, uh, to, to have an employment, because I actually got married soon after I graduated from college, and my wife is sitting here. And even that experience, I mean, the, all the, the negativity, negativity that surrounds, surrounded my life in growing up, even a blind person was supposed to be married. Those things are, are, are kind of taboo, kind of are, are not normal. And then carrying that with me, uh, with, with, with my other colleagues with disabilities, and trying to influence government to make things better, to become more positive, receptive, inclusive, the way they do business. So now they have, these are changing Fiji, and then taking on the responsibility beyond Fiji in the Pacific, in the work that I do now, uh, which started many years ago. And also the same thing that was in the Pacific. At that time, there was only a couple of countries that were really uh, that had this, uh, a movement of person disabilities. So then, then uh, I used to go to Thailand and uh, Bangkok because of UN meetings and other parts of uh, the Asia Pacific. There used to be one or two of us only. There was very little representation of the Pacific in those Asia Pacific forum. There was very little voice. And I was uh, there, I used to admire my friend on my left here. There were other uh, people that were championing their cause. So why should the Pacific be left behind? Why should geography, why should isolation, why should smallness of size, why should developing economy 
be the reason of why development should not be equal or be the same or similar. So then we also took also the opportunity with a few other colleagues and then we said let's work on forming an organization in the Pacific that usually call it this way, that look Pacific, that taste Pacific, that smell Pacific. <laughs> That's the Pacific Disability Forum. And we took it upon ourselves and working with allies and, 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 and agreed totally with the senator here. We cannot do it alone. So we work with our partners. And at that time, the colleague of uh, my desk of NZ8, I believe, is in his audience. And work with both that there, there are possible governments. So he's also a student here at ANU. I just met him here. So it's working with uh, people who are, I guess, share your passion and vision to make things better. And looking back in the last uh, few years, uh, the, the 10 years, that we've come a long way in, a, um, in the Indo Pacific from like three, four countries to now across the 16 Pacific countries and territories, even not 19. Where we have disabled persons organization sharing the same passion and driven under the, under the same agenda and working with uh, development partners like, like OZAID, though NZAID is a uh, decide to, to, uh, to look elsewhere or do other things about development because I just uh, told Stephen sometimes and I and ask him uh, the, and, and, and he corrected me I and mean, he's rightly so the, the, the argument in disability about economic development versus social development and where do we fit in the middle and sometimes and, and what we've been talking about this week the reference group the, the costing the cost benefit analysis on work related disability. Sometimes we are costed, just like if we, are, we are a bridge or we are a building. So I think, so these, these are the things I guess that, that kind of shaped uh, my thinking and, and, and kind of drive me to do the things that I do and probably had led to be why I'm here on this table. Thank you, Steve. Excellent. All right, well, again, that's uh, extremely, um yeah, there's a lot, a lot to be said about that. I think uh, we'll go on though and come back to you, Seda. Thanks a lot for sharing all that with us. Uh, so now, Charlotte, over to you. And I guess similarly open-ended in terms of your experience, but I guess you are from a donor and uh, we'd be particularly interested in hearing about your current work within the USAID. Sure. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I think I'd like to preface um, my remarks about my current work at USAID by saying that, you know, disability has been basically absent from the development agenda broadly. Um, and this is not something that's unique to any one agency. It's just been the case um, broadly. Um, and what's happened overall has been that disability has really s been seen um, as a charity issue. Um, and that people with disabilities have been seen as recipients and not necessarily as catalysts or facilitators, facilitators of change and development. That is beginning to change, fortunately. And I think we're beginning to see more and more donors um, that are developing policies um, and that are thinking through how to um, program for disability inclusive development. Um, USAID has had a policy for a fair amount of time. The policy came out um, in 1997. So if you think about that, that's, that's a long time ago. And that happened not because the administrator at the time thought, oh, gee, this is a, a good issue, we want to think about it, but because there was a strong disability movement in the United States. Um, that pushed the agency and said, you know, any U.S. dollars that are being used for development for foreign assistance should be thinking about um, disability um, and development. And that policy is essentially a non-discrimination policy. Um, but of course, times have changed. The policy came out in 1997. Um, we're in 2013, and much has happened in the development world. Um, and we now have the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities that has been ratified by over 130 countries, unfortunately not by the U.S. yet. Um, but I think that, you know, it does, it, it has influenced the way we are thinking about um, disability inclusive development. So, I mean, I think there are a couple of issues that I've um, sought to focus on within, within the agency. Um, 
But just maybe to back up a bit and say that my position at the agency is a new position. Um, it's the first time ever that the agency has a full-time coordinator on disability inclusive development at a senior level. Um, and my position was part of the Obama administration, so I was appointed by the president. And I, and I say this not because I, I want to brag, even though I do want to brag, <laughs> but because it's so important to have that political that political sense that this is really an issue for us to think about. I mean, there were so many other issues that could have been selected. So I think that that's really important. So having the political will um, at the highest level is absolutely essential. Um, I think that, so, so that, that's been very important for me because I've been able to come into the institution, into the agency with that sense of gravitas and support of, 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 an, of an administration. Um, so what do I do when I, when I get there? I mean, it's, it's one of those situations where I'll, you're there now and the expectations are huge. They're huge from within the agency, but they're also huge from outside. So there's that external push and there's the internal push. Um, so what I, what I thought I would do was to focus on trying to institutionalize the issue within the agency because we have a coordinator now, we don't know that we'll have a coordinator forever. Um, so in trying to institutionalize it, I thought looking at um, embedding disability inclusive development into the policies of the agency would be important. And not necessarily the disability policy, but all the new policies that are coming out of the agency. So if you look at the suite of, say, there's, there's, there's a whole range of new policies that have come out um, of USAID. And they range from youth, gender, climate change, um, education. All of these include disability inclusive development. At some, you know, and, and they range, some more and some less. But the idea is that you want to make it part of everybody's work. It can't just be the work of the coordinator. It has to be something that's internalized by the agency, or as I like to say, it has to become part of the DNA of the agency. Um, so I think that that's been very important. I think the other part to that is then finding ways to ensure that policies are translated into the programmatic piece of the agency's work. And that's, that's difficult. Um, that, I think, requires A, skilling up staff within the agency. So um, one of the things that we did was to develop an online course on disability inclusive development. It's a very basic course, but it really takes a staffer through what are the key issues and how do you do this. Um, we're hoping then to do a second course that will drill down you know, and, and be a, a bit more um, um, substantive in terms of some of the conceptual issues. So I think skilling up um, and building capacity in-house is absolutely key. Um, I don't expect every single person in the agency to be an expert on disability inclusive development, but I do expect every single person in the agency to think about it when they're developing programs, whatever it is that they're developing. So that's been, that's been an important piece. I think linked to that is the need to have um, to, you know, the necessary tools and matrix. So you know, do you have the how-to notes? Do you have um, tools to assist staffers in, in, in thinking this through and, and translating um, the policies into actual programs? Um, and then I think you know, the other piece is um, really just building the capacity um, in the countries in which we work. Um, and that has been, in, in the case of USAID, I would say a strong point. So working to build the capacity of disabled people's organizations in the countries in which we work, I think, has been really important. And I think what that does is it helps create the demand and the push. So we're having DPOs um, say to, to um, aid missions that may not be including disability, why aren't you doing this? And holding them accountable. So I think that that's, that's, that's a really important issue. Um, I do think that there are some kind of common um, issues that have prevented 
um, a better kind of movement around uh, movement or advancement of um, disability within the global agenda. And I think that there, the one is that it's, there's some structural constraints. I think there are definitely some attitudinal constraints. Um, so the whole issue around prejudice, fear, um, discrimination, um, and stigma remain a huge issue, and an issue that I, I think that we haven't paid attention enough to. Um, and then structural, I mean, you know, obviously you've got the physical, but I think it's more than just, as Rosemary loves to say, let's just get over the ramps. You know, it's not just the ramps, um, but it's 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 about ensuring that you have strong institutions, institutions that can hold governments accountable, <coughs> institutions that can ensure enforcement of legislation, codes, and standards that are in place. I mean, I've been to countries where you have just the most brilliant pieces of legislation, and then when you look around, you're like, oh wow, you know what happened here, but you don't have the institutions to, um, to actually ensure that um, there, there's compliance. Um, I mean, I think there's just some common, th some common things that we need to think about as development practitioners, um, development scholars going forward, and that is that, you know, development cannot continue in the way that it does if it does not recognize um, and include 15% of the world's population of which, of which are people with disabilities. Um, and that I think, you know, getting, it, getting people with disabilities involved as participants, um, as contributors from the beginning, help, help getting them involved in the design of programs is really what we should be doing. Um, I think what, what encourages me every day is that they are increasingly, uh, as I said, a number of donors that are thinking about, um, that, 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 that are addressing the issue of disability inclusive development. But I think we're seeing a far greater sophistication amongst disabled people's organization in relation to this issue. Um, I put out a call to academics and actually maybe a challenge to academics. I know there are a couple in this room that are doing some great work, but I mean, broader than that, I think that we need to really start seeing academics thinking about the issue of disability and, and development and, you know, really seeing it as a discipline and not as just, oh, gee, that's, you know, a trend or, or you know, an interesting issue, but it really is a discipline. And how do we bring these two disciplines together—the discipline of disability and the discipline—and uh, the—and and the disability and the discipline of, of development? So, I think really for me, some of the important aspects for addressing or trying to heighten um, the inclusion of persons with disability in, in in the development world is providing voice for persons with disability, voice and agency. Um, addressing issues around invisibility of persons with disabilities um, in our programming and ensuring that um, we are better, uh, we better understand what this means. Um, and then I think finally working um, in the communities in which we work to, to, um, to do away with some of the very negative societal norms that don't recognize the value and worth of, of persons with disabilities. Um, and I think I'll stop there. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Charlotte. I think it just shows the best uh, talks of those without PowerPoints. Um, I'm serious. I want to uh, start the discussion, so please um, think of your questions. But I will just uh, go back to our panel and see if any of you want to pick up on any of the remarks uh, made so far. I mean, one common theme I picked up was the importance of politics and uh, alliances uh, for change. And I'd be interested in you know, the sense of whether you see in your countries, uh, Senator and uh, Senator, where do you see that the, the political will there? And then also uh, in terms of um, you know being an absent issue from development and, and what Charlotte said about the role of the donors, how useful you think our donors you know had been or could be on this issue, or whether it's an issue where change has to come uh, from within. So any, uh, would you like to, <coughs> Senator, sure. start off the, sort of the second round? Oh. Yeah, just briefly. Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, well, uh, we have planted uh, the seeds of, of our involvement, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, first starting with self-advocacy and then forming alliance with people with com common issues, common problems and difficulties to face and to achieve. And then finally, 
uh, insert ourselves as, as important contributors to the society. So that has paid the, the price, actually. Um, we, are, we have gone uh, in transition now from uh, being solely put in the uh, res uh, you know, position of being recipient of uh, charity help uh, moving forward towards uh, uh, being a rights holder and also um, uh, effective and, and full participants in, in, the, in the mainstream social, po political, economic uh, sphere of the, of the country. Uh, we're struggling now to uh, Seth had just mentioned a while ago that uh, people have been arguing whether disability inclusive development is the matter of putting extra costs. We're trying to redefine such a thing and try to explain to our government, not only Thai government, but government within this region, that it is actually an, a, so, a long-term social economic investment. And, and, and that's what I've been trying to do uh, in, in, in my country as well. Because you, believe it or not, uh, right now you heard from Charlotte that we have 15% of the world population who have disabilities. And the number is going to keep growing. Not growing just because people recognize or self or proclaim themselves uh, of being persons with disabilities, but because we are moving rapidly into aging society, we're moving into heavy industry, we're moving into more accidents and more uh, environmental hazards and all kinds of things like that. So disability will e increase d tremendously. Investing today is about long-term insurance for our future. So this is a, a really serious issue. We're not talking about somebody else, we're talking about everyone here in this room. So this is a very big task for myself and for, for my friends in my country, uh, we are trying to involve all sectors to, to rethink disability, not as a minority group, but as something that could be with anyone and benefiting all people. So this is the big task that, that I, I've been coming across and it's, uh, I'm still climbing the, the ladder, by the way. So this is my second, second run. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So you want to add to that? Yeah, okay. Yeah. This one? Yeah. 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 Just, yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, the, the, the uh, political will, uh, it is very important. Um, Charlotte did talk about that, and uh, the politician on my left here, <laughs> uh, Senator Muntian, uh, promotes that. It is very, very important. Um, I, 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 uh, I, I'm, I'm hesitating because um, I don't want to talk about politics in Fiji. <laughs> <laughs> but why not? Nonetheless, <laughs> n n nonetheless, there, there has been political in Fiji. Uh, the they've signed through the the current uh, re regime. Uh, they've signed up to the the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2010. They've adopted a, pol a disability policy and um, have done other measures. But I think what is key is how those policy uh, are implemented, uh, the, 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 connect, the connection between policy and practice. Because we can have good policies, we can have good legislation, if it's not seeing the light of day, if it's not impacting the lives of people that matters the most, and they remain in, in shelves in government, government departments, or even in organizations, uh, drawers, it's, they're no good. No good to anybody, to those who develop it and to the beneficiaries of those policies. So I think that's, um, the, 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 it is important to have political will. It certainly helps make the, the, the drive the process of, uh, you know, in a case of uh, personal disabilities, when it's political, it makes the, the space, it creates a space for us to be included, to be at the table, because I think, and then that's the other thing that I was, I was going to mention about uh, working with development partners or with governments. The, uh, what, what I found in, in, in the work, in the experience I've had, in, uh, and whether it be a, a development, a government officer in a rural uh, Fiji, an outlying country, an outlying island, and in the Pacific where 
traditionally and, and culturally, disability is often related, related to ancestral curse, parental misdeed, that your parents did something wrong or stole money from the church offering, something like that. And then linked to the, 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 the association of the witchcraft. So those kind of things really put us in a tight corner that when we try to mm -hmm. f claim for our space, and in a culture where like, you respect the elders, you kind of do what you're told. So you find yourselves in this space where there's a, a lot of oppression against you. And as a person with disability, with an addition of a disability around this cultural context, it can become very, very difficult. And you, you, you almost have to develop a hard, thick skin, I guess, which, what, which, which is what I did, I think, I suppose to be able to help overcome these barriers. But I think once, and that's, and, and, and when I share with, uh, with other specific countries, sometimes um, getting us included to be at the table. What is the relationship? What is your attitude? If I come as a person with disability to you, in your office, you are a government officer uh, providing services. What is the relationship, right? My, my argument is the relationship is never equal at, even at that point. And it's a lot to do with our attitude. It's a lot to do with our judgment. The other few, just a couple of weeks ago, when I'm talking about Alliance, uh, the Pacific Disability Forum is part of the Pacific Regional NGO Alliance, and we, were, we met with the Pacific Plan Review Team. And we were talking about, and so some talk about um, uh, donor agencies coming with their big pockets. And I said, I don't think it's about big pockets. Development is not about having big pockets. It's about treating, uh, it's treating each other equally as equal partners in development. I think the area of disability, I think that's what I found to have worked very well with your government in Australia through AZID. We have been treated as an equal partner. We may not have uh, at the outset what you actually need, but there are things that we bring to the table that you even need to consider that is worth a, uh, the, the respect, that's worth uh, giving the opportunity to be an equal partner in that space. Because, I mean, development is not just about money. Development is about practice, development is about how you become a partner to that, those providing the money to see those impact delivered and making if impact, impact on the ground. So I guess I've covered quite a few things in, 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 in my uh, second round here. So it's about overcoming this in the Pacific, Culturally, there's a lot of things going uh, that make life tough for persons with disabilities. But how then we create the enabling environment? How we create a safe space for them to for, for them to to become themselves, uh, for them to uh, empower themselves and be empowered and supported, so that they become equal partners in development. Thank you, Steve. Thanks, uh, Sedan. Good to hear those uh, positive words about the Aussie approach. Charlotte, do you, do you want to add anything at yeah. this stage? Yes, I would like to actually. Sure. Um, I think that, you know, from for, certainly from a donor perspective, I think that there are um, a couple of things that, as Seta said, you don't necessarily have to have um, deep pockets and or bags and bags of money. I think, you know, there are things like influencing the policy dialogue. You know. You're at the table, you're talking about it, you're talking about disability inclusive development as, as part of an integral part of the larger development agenda, I think is, is, is really important. Um, this may have obviously resource con um, implications, but building capacity. Um, and you know, here I point to um, AusAIDS award, um, uh, awards. And I think that that's you know, a really positive example of how you can build capacity um, to address the issue of disability inclusive development going forward in, 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 in um, partner countries. And I think just overall, um, donors could do a better job in terms of collecting disaggregated data um, on disability um, on in, in the programs that, that we're already engaged, that we already have. Um, and, and, and that's about you know, going back to the drawing board and looking at you know, how, what is it that we're doing, what type of data are we collecting, um, and, 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 and then finding ways to include um, better data on, on, on disability. 
And then I, I think another one, another area which is pretty obvious is, is the one around sharing best practices. Um, and I think, you know, speaking, you know, donors talking to each other, donors talking to, you know, um, country, uh, country partners is really important in that regard. Um, working with DPOs in that regard is also important. But I think there's also something else that um, we don't do enough of, and that's sharing what is possible. You know, I've worked in countries where people with disabilities can't imagine that you could have an accessible transportation system. It's just not something that they have started to think about um, because this is not, they've never been exposed to it. Um, so I think sharing what is possible really helps um, certainly disabled people because it helps you think, well, gee, we can actually, we can actually get there. This is what accessible transportation may look like. Um, so I think doing a better job of that and then I think providing technical assistance is, is really important. Um, and again, I think there are different ways in which that can happen. And leading at the global level is always important. Good. Right, well now, uh, it's really this forum is in your hands. Uh, we're going to um, turn over to questions. We'll maybe get a few questions and comments and then um, go back to the panel. Uh, I will just remind you, we are recording this, so if you do want to say something, I encourage you to. You will be on the record. Uh, I know we have other experts here, other members of the Disability Reference Group, but I also encourage you to uh, participate. Um, I think Lachlan has to change the battery. No, the microphones, just speak loudly, and maybe mention your name, just name where you're from, and um, over to you. Uh, I'd like to get away with two comments, if I can. I'm Christine Lachlan, I'm the Executive Officer of Australia's Disability and Development Consortium. Excuse me. Um, the first one is that this being an election year, um, if you go to our web page, we've got a call to action to our politicians, and I, I'm bringing that to your attention because it aligns with what Charlotte had to say in her comments about the political buy-in and about how it has to be uh, not just a policy, it has to be systemic within any policy. So what we're actually, one of our asks is to have a, an ambassador for disability, as, a, as we have for the HIV, within the, the, the uh, AUSAID office. And um, the only way we're going to get that is if people make us know that that's what we need. So we've been lobbying very hard to both the coalition and to the Labor government to say um, this is your opportunity to um, either make a statement if you're going to do it or to do it now. Um, we will, we, we're asking for it to be appointed roughly the Deputy Director General's uh, position. So it will be a systemic way of thinking within um, the program development area. So um, don't go away and just say you had a nice morning or afternoon. You can do something. You can write that letter and ask them to write to the Foreign Minister, the Shadow Foreign Minister, and you can make that difference. So I encourage you quite actively. The second thing is I have to have to do this. It's um, uh, when we were working on, on today, the uh, flyer that came out to say, uh, is disability the latest fad? And obviously I reacted quite passionately because a few of my colleagues up what's wrong. Um, I found that a really um, disturbing question. And the question one of my colleagues said to me was, perhaps you could ask, would they be game enough to say, is gender the latest fan? Mm -hmm. And if so, um, would you be brave enough to, to put that in writing? So um, I challenge that. And that just shows me how people are thinking about disability still. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Well, that's, thanks for the comments, and um, maybe we'll go on to another one and maybe come back to the panel. People sure. can react to the comments a bit later on. Hi, yeah. uh, yeah, I'm Jonathan Bright from the Development Policy Centre, and it seems like the common theme here is the institutionalisation of this issue in development practice. My question is, we're now four years into AusAid's five-year disability inclusive development strategy. How is AusAid progressing on institutionalising and incorporating it into AusAid's DNA? And what more needs to be done both internally within AusAid and what can we do as both internal and external actors in aid development space to improve this inclusive, this institutionalisation? Yeah, so I guess these members are from the reference group. I guess you have your own views of AusAid. You must see AusAid every now and then. Yeah. And I know Fleur's here from AusAid. Maybe you could also mm. contribute to that question. Yeah, any, so anyone else like to contribute to the discussion at this point? Yeah, please. Uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Hashim Nan. I'm with the CBM Partnership at the University of Melbourne. 
Uh, my question relates to the uh, issue around uh, non-discrimination, which has two equal parts of equality and equity. And in terms of equity, is my question, uh, the 15% uh, and 1.2 billion uh, gets presented in forums. Uh, do the representation from the DPOs uh, uh, give that uh, equity in the representation of the 1.2 billion? Or uh, what proportion of that gets represented by DPOs? It's the first question. The second is, in terms of uh, the uh, uh, historical analysis of conventions and legal uh, uh, instruments uh, around the world, uh, to take the example of the US, um, the uh, legal uh, arguments would be that uh, looking at the census, it indicates at that time there were 43 million people with disabilities in the US. And the legislations, the various legislations, are, including the Individuals with Disability Education Act, ADA, and so on, the case law and uh, such things accounted uh, for analysis which indicated that only 30 million people are covered under those body of legislation. So when you look at that, what do the panel's perspective on the coverage of the UNCRPD and uh, your comments on that, please? Okay, thank you very much. Well, especially with this last question on the US, and it is kind of your turn, Charlotte, to start. So oh. would you be willing to uh, kick off the panel's response? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, I mean, just to Christine's point, um, and I'm not sure that you, exp you were hoping that the panel would answer it. I think that that question was more directed at Stephen, but um, I'll give it a shot. I, I mean, I think disability inclusive development is absolutely not a fad. Um, I think, if anything, it's increasingly um, a development issue that's been discussed um, in very serious fora. Um, last week, it was being discussed at the Indigenous Peoples Forum. Um, in September, there's going to be a high-level meeting in New York um, on disability and inclusive de uh, and development that will bring together hopefully heads of state, but certainly very senior people from from government. So it's it's not a fad. I mean, I think it's very much um, a piece of our development discourse today. Um, Jonathan. You know, I think I was one of the um, early members of the disability reference group uh, for us aid, and actually even before that, commented on the development for strategy when I was at the bank in its draft form. And I think if we look at that, the time frame. Um, that AusAid has had in relation to the strategy, I think that they have been great advancements um, in um, addressing and, and working towards institutionalizing the issue of disability inclusive development. Um, I think that you know, there's always room for more, um, but I do think that there has been a significant amount of progress um, in relation to that. Um, I just think that even just even our last couple of meetings and we're speaking to some of the same people and you can see that their knowledge of the issue has increased in two years. Um, but I do think that, you know, we, we would, I think we would like to see that it really becomes an integral piece of all of their work. So I think it's work in progress. Um, and I, I hope one of the things that our that our group does is is to continuously remind um, Ozaid of the importance of, of institutionalizing that. So that's you know that's partly one of our our roles. You know, Hashim, I think in terms of um, the coverage the coverage of the CRPD. I mean, I think it's. The CRPD obviously uh, applies to all persons with disabilities, irrespective. Um, and I think that um, it's, it's difficult to say um, what the percentage is right now in terms of the benefits of, of the CRPD, because it really, it still is a very new document, a new treaty. Uh, I think countries are, those member states that have ratified are in the process of of looking at various, um, uh, uh, looking at implementation. 
Um, so I think it's it's early days to actually say you know what percentage or what is the coverage in terms of that document. But that said, I think it provides an excellent framework um, for universal coverage. Um, and I think that you know as 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 governments think about you know sectoral policies, um, that's something that they will hopefully will be thinking about. But I think it's I think it's an area to be to be mindful of and and one to watch. Great, thank you. Um, Seda, would you like to? Yeah, just just uh, very briefly on on, on the where OZ is now in terms of uh, the DNA disability inclusive development within OZ, like like Charlotte, uh, 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 along with uh, one of the early members of the of the reference group. But also uh, uh, quite actively involved in the development of the of the DFA development for, for all itself, uh, particularly from the uh, from the Pacific. Uh, it, it is it is certainly evident, and, and I think I'd like to um, link the the evidence of uh, the increasing awareness and, and and willingness, the filtering down to the post, the the, the OZ post in country, and I'm, I'm talking about the Pacific here. How how uh, OZ missions, OZ posts, uh, the staff are being made aware, and, and in some cases are actually playing a, a, doing a very good job about ensuring the active participation, the person disabilities consultation, genuine consultation with disabled persons organisations. So across the Pacific, where the and there's been sharing of uh, of information, and I think some also, also training of uh, OZ staff to embrace and, and also deliver on, on the DFA um, uh, strategies as well as the actual try to embed that in their day-to-day -day work. So like Charlotte, it is work in progress. Um, where are we now? 2013, four, four years uh, down, down the road after implementation of the development for, all, I guess, three years more seriously. The, um, even, even in terms of the support to uh, I guess the last question around DPO involvement, I think it depends on, 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 on the space that's given to them, how they can represent themselves. I end up, in, uh, a couple of years back, I went to one of the Pacific Island countries, uh, and, and that's the first time they saw a blind person working with a cane. So you, you come across these kind of situations where you, 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 you get to meet, meet with people, the reality that I think that, that Charles was talking about earlier, about even the possibilities. Can persons with disabilities go to school? I mean, those the things are, are, very, are very important, are very key, and DPOs can address those, one, if they're given space to mobilize themselves and given room and, and support where necessary uh, to, be, to, to, to voice, to be their own voice in educating their issues. Thank you. Thank you. In turn. Thank you again. Uh, well, first of all, um, it's time for me to talk about OS8 now, but now that I've covered um, the, the content that I wanted to say. Um, I think it's because of OS8, a uh, 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 strong effort on this issue. We, we have seen a recognition of so-called disability inclusive development being articulated in many, many uh, regional international policy um, yeah. a framework and guidance and uh, or, or all kinds of things like that are be, being well, more recognized for the past few years and I, I can witness that because I've been through all of this um, um, formulation. Um, among developer, uh, development uh, professionals, I think this concept is beginning to, to, to sink in uh, and from observing from a uh, perspective of a D DRG member, I, I could see that within OSAID, uh, we have seen more um, effort from different sectors to, to involve disability perspective, uh, to, to make their programs more disability inclusive. Uh, that's a welcoming sign we just need to go further to to see the real 
uh, indicator of of the the practice of that, and we see the the the, the energy coming from different sides. Now we see the document, we see the written statement, we see the um, planning, uh, and and also acknowledgement uh, from top. Uh, down to the practitioners, but but we have to look uh, further to see the uh, the actual outcome, and I think the Aussie is heading towards that direction. So so having said that, I, I I think we are positive, and that's why I keep saying that we have to give up on giving up. Mm-hmm. And uh, as far as the question concerning the coverage of the uh, law, uh, citing from from the US as, uh, as an example. Um, in the human rights perspective, you know, uh, statistics cannot justify to do or not to do. It's even if we have one single person, we have to do it. Uh, and, and, and actually, uh, CRPD uh, recognized disability among those who never even identify themselves as persons with disabilities. So it's beyond the scope of any statistics or data collection. So it's, it's, uh, it's something that is quite, uh, it, it's a great challenge to all of us. You know, uh, we, we are striving to, to meet this very high goal, but yet we have to come back to reality as well. Yeah. So even if we have been able to achieve only one in a hundred, or climb up to 10 or 20 or 30 percent. That that only reminds us that we 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 need to do more. That's it. We cannot just say, oh, we're we're not going to get there, so we might just uh, stay away from it. No, cannot do that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, did you want to add anything on that? Uh, I'll talk mm-hmm. very briefly because um, I think we very much agree with the panel's assessment. We've, we've made some possible. progress. We, we can point to some of, of the achievements through the strategy, concrete things like children being able to, to go to school as a result of our mainstream education programs, looking at the issues of disability, incorporating ramps, training teachers in inclusive education approaches and that sort of thing. We, we have very a much stronger awareness among the SOS aid staff of the issues than we did a few years ago and definitely very strong leadership up to the top. Our Director General is in Vietnam today with the Executive Director of UNICEF launching the State of the World Children Report which focuses on children with disability this year. I'm going to have to leave in a moment to provide some (laughs) final updates to the speech um, so that we can um, play that that global leadership role that we're trying to play on disability as well. And I I think that's something to note that, that we really see part of our contribution in this space is not just what we're trying to do through our aid program, which is very important, but also advocating on this issue internationally so that others, UNICEF, the World Bank, other donors, and countries in our region are looking at how they can progress these issues as well. So, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, we'll go back for more questions. I'll just, uh, I didn't want to participate because I'm the chair, but since the question of the flyer came up and I did uh, work on the flyer, I'm sorry. Uh, Christine, if you didn't, you didn't like it, but I, I guess we, as a think tank, we do try to bring together people with different views, and we often have arguments. You know, a lot of people actually think the aid budget should be cut, right? And so we, we argue about aid and you know whether it should be increased or cut, and how it can be better spent. I think it's good to have these questions raised, and we've, we're having a good discussion today. So that's in defence of the the flyer, but that's all. <laughs> I, I am only chairing the event, so uh, I do want to encourage more questions, please. Um, thank you. My name is Beth Sprunt. I'm from the, the Nossel Institute for Global Health, also within the CBN Nossel Partnership for Disability Inclusive Development. So I've, I've got two questions. One is, um, so disability inclusive development, I'll just put on my teacher's hat, <laughs> has often been known as a twin track, where you have disability specific services are needed, as well as mainstreaming disability within development programs. So my question is, have we, having come, you know, so 30 years ago where it was heavily around rehab and assistive devices and medical intervention, where we're probably now 
you know, we're certainly looking at the mainstream track a lot more. But are we, are we at the point now where we need to think, actually, the health systems that need to make this all work, are they keeping up with this agenda? Are, are we also meeting the, those specific needs of people with disability? And the second question, um, with the, the post-2015 discussions that are going on with you know, a lot of hope for social inclusion, do you imagine that we'll, you know, those of us who are involved in this disability inclusive development movement, what do we think will this will feel like? You know, do you feel that there are any changes on the horizon? Okay, good questions. We'll take a few more or other comments. Yeah, my name's uh, Robin James. I'm from your organisation called Havens. Um, I just have a question uh, about the Bulaco and Romanian framework, which is, I, mean, I realise is finished. What, um, I just wonder if the panel has any comments on what, what, what did that achieve? What were some of the achievements of the framework? Okay. Yeah. There's somebody in the back. Oh, okay. It's an Gender Consortium Centre for Development Studies at Queen's University and just started at Coffee International Development. Um, I have a very broad accountability mechanism of having DPOs um, around, just broad, but I'm interested in the specific, some more specific accountability mechanisms at organisational level and examples of those. So you know, what, what's been proposed at USA or, or used to actually get accountability institutionalised. All right, they're great questions. I think, and I'll open it to any anyone who'd like to go first, or you don't have to answer all of them. Whichever ones you think you know you you can best contribute on. Well, before I forget, I can I? Yeah, sure. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I. Sorry, I'm get, getting a bit. Um, in short-term memory. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I, I think um, uh, dealing with the question of how do we th see ourselves in the post 2015, I think we have to really look at uh, two spectrums here. Uh, we, we we see disability as a cross-cutting issue. You know that should should be included in all aspects of whether existing aid goals or more goals or whatever the, MF, the, the, the MDGs will produce, or post MDGs will produce, we see a disability issue. But uh, through that sense, we also need to address disability issue that needs extra attention, not because we want to be isolated, but we want to call attention that that has been lacking for so long. Something that I think the gender people have done quite successfully is that they they say, oh yeah, we are part of the intersectionality, you know, part of the marginalized vulnerables, but we have extra value to that. We, we need to keep the gender as both integral part of the marginalized and uh, a special issue. I think disability also needs that kind of mentality, you know, because it, it is disproportionately neglected issue. It has been so. So we need to, mm. to see it from, from both dimensions. Uh, that, that's, what, that's what I think we have to, to work for. And I think I, I, I'm beginning to see that a lot of people do, uh, are, are moving that direction as well. Uh, as um, disability inclusive development versus disability specific services, I, I don't think it's either or. I think we, we're moving towards the direction of inclusive society, in, all inclusion where everybody is, everybody counts. Uh, whether it is mainstream services or disability specific services, it must be for that purpose. The purpose of ensuring that persons with disabilities can fully and effectively participate in all aspects of life in the open, democratic, uh, participatory, you know, uh, inclusive society. That, that's a thing. So, so I see disability-specific services as just part of the whole system, not, 
not the either or kind of uh, analysis like we used to think in, in the past. We have no other choice. We have to move to the direction of you know being part of the whole thing. Do you, do you mind if I add to that? Because Thailand mm. is such an interesting example. The, the nuance to the question is not, not should we, but are we? I, I know full well that we need, you know, we need both sides of that twin track. My question is programmatically, what we're seeing globally, are we getting enough funding and our health systems actually keeping up with the demand that really should be arising and in my experience is arising where you're you know, you're, you've got people with disability who are aware of their rights and who, you know, maybe an education system is, is starting to be capable of, of including them properly, but they just don't have funding to get access to assistive devices and, and or rehabilitation or whatever the, you know, short-term medical intervention might be. Do we actually have enough that's, that's keeping both sides of the twin track? I think I'd like to quote Mahatma Gandhi if I, if I can, but I think we have enough resource for everyone in the world, but we don't have enough resource for one greedy person. <laughs> you know, it, it depends on how we manage uh, our resources that we have. Do we, you know, about how do we distribute uh, resources? How do we make sure that assistive devices are being purchased, pr procured, or even develop wisely. When we're talking about accessibility, do we make, do we, are we making use of universal design enough? Are we making of locally available, affordable assistive device based on open standards, or, or, or we spend so much money on proprietary standard assistive device? You know, and, and all kinds of things. It's just like how we do it, rather than whether it should be done or not. Thank you. Okay, great. We might go to the center yeah. because I'm sure these questions yeah. are resource constraints are very applicable for. Yes, and I was going to. Uh, I was going to dodge that question. <laughs> <laughs> you go just in front of you. Thank okay. you. Yep. Anyway, I'll start with uh, Robin's question about uh, the Biwako Millennium Framework. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, uh, that was from 2003 to 2012, last, last year. And, and I certainly can say, uh, I guess from the, from the Pacific speaking generally, um, the, yes, the, B, uh, the BMF, the Biwako Millennium Framework with its um, seven, uh, seven uh, areas, um, have, 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 have paid... Um, great dividends in disability work in the Pacific. Um, it has provided a policy framework for countries, some more Pacific island countries within the, 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 the period of the BMF have developed disability policies. The, there was also a, a strategy within the BMF of a sub-regional mechanism, and I was talking to Senator uh, Monten a few days ago about this, and how the Pacific has, has, uh, in the Pacific has captured that. And uh, BMF has allowed, given us a space to focus on the sub-region, because Asia Pacific is, is, is huge. And it's two-thirds of the population here. I mean, it's very big, and when a small Pacific island country uh, would sit alongside these big Asian giants like India and China, we are nowhere. So I think so. the, 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 the idea of a sub-region focus has, has, has been a, a real blessing to the Pacific. And I think that is kind of supported and greatly enhanced our own development in, 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 the, in the Pacific. In terms of the, uh, I, I could quite get the last question, but um, for Beth's question in terms of two interests, certainly the, um, we, we, we uh, and I, th I think uh, we would like also to encourage other DRG members to, to speak around this issue, because we were talking about health earlier on, uh, th uh, today, around um, um, services, as, as I think that the issue around uh, the medical model, and I think sometimes it, it, it can become very tricky. Um, the medical model versus, versus the human rights model, person disabilities, and and uh, where is the, the the interconnection if there is one? Uh, so as, as person disabilities, I mean, I, I made a comment earlier this morning that we we do get sick, we need those assistive devices, but I think it's in who's delivering that service, the frame in which that service has been provided and delivered. I think uh, the, and, and how. Um, uh, the consultation, and I think, the the, the to me that the, the twin track bit of that, in 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 the specialist services, is how person disabilities are consulted, are engaged in not alone, not just in the using of it, but even the design, the planning, the planning of those those services. Thank you.
Great, thanks, Helen. Uh, Charlotte, accountability and anything else? Well, I have a couple of thoughts on a couple of other things yeah. too. So, I mean, I think Beth's question is a really important one. Um, and I think that, you know, for, for the disability for the disability movement, I think in its effort to move away from the medical model, um, there was almost this throwing the baby away with the bathwater. Um, and I think that increasingly there is kind of a recognition that you know the health sector is possibly the one sector where we haven't seen disability um, inclusion as much as we should. Um, and, and again, I think this is not, you know, a particular agency. I think this is across the board. So, you know, to your point, should healthcare systems be, should, is there enough? Absolutely not. Should it be a focus? Absolutely yes. Um, but I think it needs to be a focus in terms of seeing health broadly. So looking at primary health care, um, looking at secondary health care, and, you know, all of the aspects are, are around health care. Um, I, I, again, I, I have to say that I was um, encouraged because last week in Geneva, w, the w, WHO mm -hmm. held a session, um, a high-level meeting, um, a panel actually, and um, it brought together um, senior people from various donors and other think tanks to, to start developing um, some ideas um, for the health sector in relation to disability inclusive development for the meeting in, in September. So I think that that's good. Um, and I think this is something that DPOs also need to get on board about um, because health is far more than just, you know, P&O and, and, and rehab services. That said, that is an important piece of it, but I think that that's an area that um, we need to look at more closely. I think there's been some work done in the area of HIV and AIDS and looking at um, you know, better programming or more inclusive programming, um, but really I think it's an area where much, much more can be done. Um, so to the issue around accountability mechanisms, I mean, I think, you know, obviously um, USAID is accountable broadly to the taxpayers, right? Um, and then secondly, I think more specifically in relation to the disability issues, um, we report to Congress. And we do so on, on a yearly basis um, in terms of, you know, what we've been doing um, in, in terms of implementing programs. You know, there isn't a formal mechanism within the agency per se, um, something that I think may be worth thinking about. Um, but again, I think it's about ensuring that it's part of the m and &E process, you know, um, and that, you know, people are thinking about it across the board. But we don't have a specific, we have, we have various types of reporting um, but it's not necessarily an accountability mechanism as a step as a standalone. So you've got these different pieces happening. It's just when you say you report to Congress, is that in general, or do you mean specifically on disability? Specifically on disability. disability yeah. Okay. Very interesting. All right. Well, look, sadly, uh, we are uh, pretty much out of time, so we're going to have to wrap up. I guess if, if there are any final comments or questions people would like to make, uh, this is your last chance, and then we'll go back to the panel. Uh, for, for their final comments, and we'll have to um, leave it there. So we are going to take people who haven't asked questions. Oh, sorry, actually. There's one here, one at, maybe at the back first. Then, um, yeah. Shelley Thompson, I work with Lord A, but I have been a special needs officer for the Australian Defence Force five years with several forms of extended special with the accessible stuff. So it's a wide variety. Um, mine's more of a, it's not a very clear question, but I just sort of wanted to open it up for comment. When we talk about the, uh, disability increase in development, we talk a lot about physical disability. Um, and that's an overrated in creating space, obviously participating in society for people who have physical disabilities. But what's your comments on people with mental disability or mental impairment, how we discuss it now, and in crea creating space in society for them? So there's organisations such as Special Olympics that do amazing work for <coughs> support. But how about when it comes to creating meaningful, um, sort of meaningful spaces within society for these people so they can participate not just in sport but in sort of work and other areas? So to just comments on that, or, or examples that you've seen of organisations that are doing something as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, I'm Lina Dürring from the German Development Cooperation, representing GIZ on the Disability Reference Group, yeah. or Welcome. Thank you very much indeed. 
Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be here indeed, and I would like to highlight that um, the German Development Corporation is seriously looking into the matter of disability and inclusive development since uh, several years. But what, what I would like to highlight here and put to the audience once again is that cer certainly it is an international development issue, but it is an important issue of international cooperation as well. In Germany, for example, we have had a very long tradition of very specialized services for persons with disabilities in all areas of um, society. And um, on a domestic issue, we are um, having hard times. It's a very difficult uh, transition from a very specialized system into a truly inclusive system and if we look at um, inclusive education for example certainly Germany has to learn from other countries and be it countries traditionally called as developing countries or being other countries around the world so I would like uh, to highlight that uh, disability inclusive international cooperation is certainly an issue where we have to think where how to position ourselves for the coming 10 years and what the different roles of the different stakeholders could be in international cooperation and in exchange of experiences in this regard. So be it disabled people's organization, be it academia, be it for private stakeholders and service providers, where do we want to be in five years and what is our role or specific role in ten years, for example. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, All right, I think this is the very last question at the back. Hi. Sorry, my name is Julie. I'm an essay for graduate student from Syracuse University of New York. And I just have a question for the panel, and maybe more of advice. Um, in terms of how do you work with uh, non-government groups who um, are advocating for policies, but yet how do you advocate in terms of recognizing that there are racial, gender, and class differences in these um, needs that are specified within specific communities? So I'm just wondering about your advice on how do we, um, as an NGO, for instance, um, you know, advocate for, for those needs along those lines. Because I think a lot of times within policy or just, I guess, in the U.S. context, um, that whole section around rendered race, gender, and class is, is pretty much um, <coughs> normalized as if it's the same across the board for all disability communities. So, Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering how uh, how would you suggest or what are some advice that you would um, suggest around those terms? Right. All right. Well, I think we've got three sort of very big picture mm -hmm. questions and comments. Uh, we can't go on forever, but I think that hey, I'm, I'm glad we've got such a good panel because I'm sure you can handle it all. This will be your, your, your last chance to speak. So whatever you'd like to leave us with. And this is your chance. I would have to ask you to keep it short, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. um, and whoever would like to start? It's a matter start of the uh, start of the senator. <laughs> okay, uh, senator, you've been volunteered. I've been forced to. Just, just kidding. Uh, well, before going into the uh, uh, conclusion, I, I think I um, I had to, uh, to answer a question uh, with regard to uh, some reference to Thailand when when it comes to uh, the health issue. I think uh, this is one issue that uh, we managed to. Uh, to put disability as part of the whole so-called national health uh, healthcare uh, service, uh, not specifically about rehabilitation, not specifically about uh, disability-related issues, but disability-related services are part of that integral uh, uh, national healthcare um, policy, and uh, so 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 that's I hope that answers. But but. Uh, it's still far from reality because whenever I go to a doctor, they keep asking about my eyesight rather than my sickness, you know, illness. I mean, you know. <laughs> so, uh, well, I think we have to really go back to how we f how we think about disability. Uh, if we think about disability from traditional medical uh, pathological model, I think uh, we, we are going to fix disability and we are going to shy away from it. But if we are thinking of disability as part of our everyday life, it could happen anytime and it's a social construction in our mind and in our system, in our infrastructure. 
The thing is that if we're dealing it with, you know, from this perspective, whether you call it development model, uh, social model, or human rights model, uh, you are going to think about it as something that uh, will be part of the whole process of development, as AusAid is trying to do. And uh, inclusiveness is about participation, you know, without effective, full and effective participation by those who are being targeted, it's meaningless. And uh, we have uh, been very uh, innovative about that. The, you know, the concept of DPO, Disabled Person Organization, is uh, unique within itself. That uh, I'm not saying that it is different from other NGOs, but I think it, it shows how people who realize that they, they, they have knowledge, they have problems and vision and, and uh, the way of thinking that they want to share among themselves and advocate. So by acknowledging that uh, as a beginning part of participation, I think we're on the right track. But finally, eventually, disability is not about one particular person, one particular group. It's about everyone in the society. And when I'm talking about disability, I think it should apply across the board through all impairment, not only physical, not only sensory, but across the board. You know, and, and we should talk more about supported decision making if you want to talk about you know, uh, intellectual uh, disability. But how, how, are we able to overcome that kind of you know, uh, stigma? I hope you will move on and please give up on giving up. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think to Shelley's point, um, and thank you for raising it, because I think it's um, an area that is often neglected in the development um, field. And actually, to be very honest, in the disability uh, movement itself, it's often an area that is um, least discussed, and um, I think it's clearly an important area. So I think just by acknowledging it is really a good step. Um, I think... And there are some interesting things happening in, in, in the realm of um, intellect, the inclusion of persons with intellectual disabilities. And I think there's some great examples actually coming out of Australia. Um, but I think you, know, you have organizations like um, Inclusion International, which is a member of the International Disability Alliance. So they do have um, a voice within that larger, that broader platform of um, you know, disability, um, disability organizations. And then again, I think, you know, just to draw, um, to draw reference from the CRPD, which clearly speaks to the importance of the inclusion of all persons with disabilities and addresses the issue of the inclusion of people with, in, with intellectual disabilities. But I think, honestly, um, it's an area where we haven't done enough. Um, it's an area where we need to invest in research. We need to invest in what are the good practices um, and really gain a lot more knowledge um, around how we can do, uh, you know, how we can include people with intellectual disabilities in a, mean, in a meaningful way so that we're not looking at a tokenistic kind of, okay, we've got, a, you know, people with intellectual disabilities present, but really not, um, not doing it in a sincere and genuine fashion. So that's one point. You know, to the point from um, Syracuse, I think it's, I, I think you raise a really important issue. Um, I think, you know, I think it's something that, um, again, the area of research is really needed. I know that there are a couple of people in the U.S. that are working on PhDs looking at the intersection between, say, disability and race and, and what that means, because that context is a very, is a very different one, um, looking at you know, the intersectionality between um, disability and gender is really an important one and, and is emerging as a real issue. Um, certainly within um, the organization and within the agency in which I work, but I think I think just globally there's an increased awareness that you know that there's so many commonalities and yet there's so many nuanced issues around that. Um, so you know to the mainstream to people working in the in the area of mainstream um, gender work, to start thinking about this. Um, so again, a challenge, um, and then of course classes is an important one. Um, 
Beth had mentioned the issue, and this will be my closing point, Stephen. Um, Beth had mentioned the issue around the post-2015 uh, post, uh, uh, agenda. And I think that this is really, really an excellent opportunity for us to try and get um, some serious visibility of this issue as a development issue. Um, and whether, you know, whether it's inequality or social exclusion or you know a standalone goal I think the important piece is getting um, deliberate and specific indicators and targets on disability um, because this will help us um, look at what the picture really is um, help in, in, in hopefully collecting disaggregated data but also help raising the issue. So use, using it as an advocacy, you know, using that platform, whatever it turns out to be, uh, um, as an advocacy platform. Um, and I think that we can all play a role in doing that. I mean, I think that fortunately this process um, has been a lot more inclusive, mm -hmm. just in terms of the way they're going mm -hmm. about it. So, you know, I think whether you're working in an NGO or an academia or um, in, in a donor agency, there is a role for you to play in terms of, you know, pushing, f trying to influence um, more inclusive um, frameworks um, that do reflect the importance of, of, of disability. Great. Thanks, Charles. And uh, yes, last word. Yes, my, my last word is, um, it's not business as usual. Uh, we've heard this uh, shared amongst ourselves uh, this week. Um, good development practice uh, will have to include uh, disability. And, and disability is, is, this is not a homogeneous group. The, 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 the question that was raised about intellectual disability, certainly it is um, a challenge for us in the Pacific. It is an area that as DPOs are evolving and, and are growing, how then they address within the, the movement the, um, even the minority groups within the disability movement, like person, the person with intellectual disability. Some of the, the countries like Fiji are beginning to address uh, those. But I think for, 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 for really, uh, my, my parting words is, um, what is the cost of excluding persons with disabilities? What is the cost to development? What is the cost to a country? What is the cost of a program for excluding persons with disabilities? Because I think that will challenge our thinking, and that's why I, I started my, my, my parting words in it, does, it should not be business as usual now. Mm. Things have to change if development has to be good development. Thank you. All right, so uh, thank you very much, Seto. I'm not going to try to summarize uh, the rich discussion we've had today. I'll just say the words that come to mind are rich and are learning and are inspirational. Um, before we uh, close, uh, can I just thank uh, everyone involved in organizing uh, today's event. I've already thanked our partners, but um, a couple of individuals, uh, Lachlan and uh, Macarena, uh, thank you very much. And of course, our interpreters, I'm sorry I didn't get to know you, meet you and know your name, but thank you very much. And um, uh, thank you all for coming. It's great to have such a good turnout. Uh, it shows the interest. I, I'm sure you know we could do a lot more in this area uh, with your with your support uh, but I think uh, at least for a while we've been holding back our applause <laughs> several times I felt like applauding so I think now is the time to show our thanks uh, to our three speakers <laughs>